and welcome everybody. Um, it's good to be here, and I have a quite an exciting panel uh, seated here, who is also going to be participating in the closing panel discussion tomorrow, which is going to be really interesting. So that we're sort of opening up with bookending, you know, to bookending, and. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to just briefly introduce everybody here and then get into the flow of conversation that we're going to be having this afternoon about the topic of les lessons from inclusion research. So um, I would like to start with Catherine Ullman. Uh, Catherine is a data scientist at Paradigm, a strategy consulting firm that partners with Fortune 500 companies and leading technology firms to help them build stronger, more inclusive organizations. Uh, prior to Paradigm, Catherine was trained at the Management of Organizations PhD program here at UC Berkeley's Haas School of Business. And her research at Haas focused on gender, labor market, equality, inequality, and entrepreneurship. And seated to her left is uh, Professor Emilio Castilla. Uh, he is a professor of management at the MIT Sloan School of Management. He's currently the head of the Work and Organization Studies Group. He received his PhD in Sociology from Stanford. Um, Professor Castilla studies how social and organizational processes influence key employment outcomes over time. Recently, his work has focused on the role that merit and merit-based work practices play in shaping employees' careers in today's workplace. Um, and last but not least, we have a budding doctor in the midst. Uh, Sanaz Mobaseri. She is a doctoral candidate in the Management of Organizations Department at Haas. And um, her research examines the role of emotion, cognition, and culture in shaping social network interventions in uh, tech and, in mar and looking at also labor market outcomes. Um, and she does a lot of her work in organizational settings, examining the micro foundations of uh, workplace inequality. So, um, I'm sure I've left out some really salient, wonderful, stellar things about you, and their bios are, of course, on the website. Um, next, I'd like to just run through um, the flow of our conversation today. It's going to be less of a panel discussion as we go down the row and more of an interactive conversation. And we're going to be doing this amongst ourselves for 40 minutes and then opening up to the Q&A from all of you for the last 20. And we do definitely encourage a lot of um, uh, interaction. Um, so we're, we, when we talked about what we wanted to talk about today, we, we ran through some things that we really wanted to uh, create structure around. And we, we started out, as all good researchers do, with this basic question of definition. You know, what do we mean when we talk about diversity? What do we mean when we talk about inclusion? And so we're going to spend briefly some time um, sharing ideas about what that means and what, what these researchers have found that it means in their work. Then um, we're going to move into discussing the goals of uh, inclusion research. What in academia, what, what does academia define as these goals to be? And then, um, as importantly, how, do, uh, how does this research find impact in the business world? Um, um, what, what kind of uh, research questions can be asked that are of benefit to the business world. Um, then we're going to move right into a conversation about state of the art, state of the research. Uh, we're, you know, uh, we've done the research, so you don't have to. We're going to do highlights here. Um, you know, thank goodness. Um, we're not going to be able to get to everything, of course, and we'll have resources for you for further uh, investigation afterwards if you're absolutely riveted by this topic and want to go out there and research right away. Um, and, but mostly what we're going to be focusing on is um, kind of how this all uh, looks in terms of the landscape of what's, what's still left to do. There's a lot of research. We know that there are the, the, the issues themselves are still evident out there in the world. And so what do these three <coughs> researchers uh, see from their industry and their academic perspectives that they are either tackling now or plan to tackle, and how can we move uh, the research needle forward and gain greater enlightenment that way. So um, that's our roadmap for the next 40 minutes. And then, like I said, we'll open it up to Q&A. And so what I'd like to do is start with uh, asking you three, uh, could you share some 
view, uh, your discoveries, views, opinions about um, what does diversity, the definition of it, mean to you, and um, what's a, what's helpful for the audience to know that hasn't already been discussed in terms of these definitions, diversity and inclusion. Okay, I can um, start with inclusion, and I think Aubrey did a great job in our keynote. But uh, when people use the term inclusion, typically what they're talking about is an organizational culture where people feel included, it's pretty obvious, um, and, and feel like they belong and feel like they have an opportunity to succeed. But what that, why that's really <coughs> crucial for diversity efforts is because we know that context really matters about whether or not you can reap those informational and decision-making benefits for diversity. We also know that when you're um, when you're, you know, sort of working to make an, an organization more diverse, that you really need a culture that's going to back that up. So let's say that you um, decide to hire a brand new team, and that team is incredibly diverse. You've done a great job in the hiring process. If you don't foster an inclusive culture there, you're going to find that that team becomes more homogenous over time. But I think that still opens another question, which is how do you measure inclusion? And Aubrey asked that question as well. And I think um, I don't think there's a perfect way. I think. Um, uh, like we at Paradigm approach it from multiple different angles. We we think it's it's a messy subject. It's about the subjective experience of being at work. Um, so we approach it from both a qualitative and a quantitative way. Uh, we we run that uh, the inclusion survey, which asks questions about things like belonging, decision making, voice. But we also go in and do focus groups with. Um, different key demographics, um, and we do interviews with people who are making decisions to really get a holistic picture of what's going on in the organization. Um, yeah, so I actually don't use the word inclusion in my research, mm. um, and I tend to think about diversity as differences between groups, and Aubrey, actually, you mentioned this in your keynote as well, but you, sometimes you can see those differences. They can be things that are visible, like your race or gender, um, and <coughs> other times you won't see those differences. So I hold a slightly broader definition of the word diversity, um, and most of my work is agnostic about inclusion. Hmm. So I have to admit that I come to a diversity um, from a very practical perspective. So I think that the first time that I used diversity or diverse um, in the title of anything that I wrote or that I've done was recently at MIT. Um, I convinced a couple of colleagues of mine to work together in order to offer for the first time at MIT a class uh, to executives and professionals on managing a diverse workplace. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, it was an opportunity for us to really start really thinking about how much we know about diversity, how much we know about inclusion, how much we know about all these different terms and different concepts that organizations are using in order to make decisions that have to do with the way they manage individuals in the workplace. Um, Research-wise, I came to inclusion and to diversity, I feel like somehow through the back door. Uh, what's the back door? Um, for, uh, for a number of years, I spent a lot of time uh, working with organizations, thinking about how to hire the best, how to promote the best, how to um, retain the best. And in the, in the process of doing so, I ended up really working a lot on meritocracy, right? A lot of the things that have been talk, we've been talking about up to now. And I think one of the most difficult exercises that I've done as an academic recently was actually asked to basically define meritocracy, mm -hmm. which is basically what, what you're asking us to define, define these terms, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm just going to talk briefly about meritocracy for, for a number of reasons so you understand how I link it to diversity and inclusion. So when, when I came to define meritocracy in, in this entry that I did, I was thinking about a social system that advances individuals um, and rewards individuals based on their merit, um, regardless of their class, origins, and demographics. And then I started thinking more about the concept of meritocracy in practice, and a true, the operation of a true meritocracy implies two things, right? two conditions. One of them is that there has to be inequality in the distribution of rewards and outcomes, um, right? So we ha it means that in a given organization, we understand that some people are going to be hired, others do are not going to get hired, others are going to be promoted, others are not going to be promoted. And the second condition has to do that there has to be equal opportunity. And I think here is where like diversity and inclusion um, operates from my point of view. Equal opportunity means that the I diverse society 
right, has to uh, feel somehow included in a lot of the things that organizations are doing for one of the most basic conditions of meritocracy to operate mm -hmm. uh, in the workplace. Then there is the question of whether there is true meritocracy, meritocracy or not, and we can come back to that later. So, I'm gonna. Can I ask you a challenging question? <laughs> Given that you don't, you uh, thank you for that. Um, moving into the, the the realm of inclusion research, um, I I want to ask you if you don't use inclusion as a term, or you choose not to. Um, did, if I understood correctly, you're not yeah. using it as a term, and you how do, how do you then approach this whole area of what are the what's the goal of of inclusion research according to you then? That was a nice transition to the <laughs> second point. I just I want to say um, just two other things about these words. I think there's a whole language around diversity and inclusion and I think that causes a lot of people anxiety and stress that's mm. counterproductive to the goal. Mm. So um, actually at Haas this semester student-led initiative uh, to have a class around talking about race and mm. race related terms just to help reduce some of that anxiety. So. I think it's useful to push people to be precise when they're talking, make sure we understand what they're talking about and how it matters in their context, but that we all agree that this is what inclusion means and this is how we measure it. I'm not sure we need that to uh, do the things we're talking about doing today. Okay, sorry, I want to get that out. Thank and um, yeah, goals. Okay. Your question is about goals. I have a, there are a lot of goals, I think. I made a list. Um, yeah, so I try to understand differences between groups, I, but also all groups. Um, I, Marianne mentioned that we research, we hope research moves past documenting differences between groups towards thinking about interventions, ways to reduce the differences, or um, things that, levers that might offer uh, solutions, things that might make inequal, mitigate inequalities. I think those are useful goals. I do think to do that, we have to be honest about what differences are there and what differences are not there and the size of those differences. I think that's something researchers can help inform. Mm -hmm. So um, we know that there are, so by that I mean, uh, we know gender and race play out and work in many different ways and some of those ways are bigger than others. Some are more consequential than others. So moments like evaluation or promotion, those are consequential moments. And there are other things that come up in the nature of work uh, where we might also see differences, and I don't know how big that difference is relative to what matters to a, a moment of evaluation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and then um, another goal with respect to tech in particular is that tech is constantly inventing new things that I'm trying to keep up with understanding how that's affecting human interaction and work and what's happening inside of organizations. So that's in a, like, I don't know how to use social media. I, I, I barely know how to use the internet beyond Google Scholar. But um, that's, it's actually a shame because so much of the kind of work that everyone is doing now is very different than what I did even 10 or 11 years ago. So uh, I'm tr that's one of the big goals for me in terms of tech research. Yeah, I mean, to add, I think that, that technology is being created and used by tech companies in ways that are going to um, advantage researchers. So, for example, um, in sort of the labor market inequality, there's been this challenge between, um, you know, the population who might want to be hired and then the population that gets hired. There's not that much information. They called it the black box for a little bit. But now we have these applicant tracking systems that I get to play with every day. So I get to play with the data from it every day. And you can follow individuals through a process. And that data can be really important in sort of informing these questions about at, at what points through, it, are, are companies having challenges with respect to attracting applicants? Are companies having challenges with respect to moving applicants through different stages? And what are those stages? And why, why are those happening? But of course, like you really need to understand the local context of the of the company to understand like how in the interview stage are uh, applicants being evaluated. Is that different than how they're being evaluated at the screening? And and you know as people in other panels were were talking about, where are those evaluations coming from? Is there any consistency? That's often a challenge that I see in organizations. You ask them, okay, what what are your criteria? And the answer is either different for different people or, um, well, we hire MBAs. And then you say, well, why do you hire MBAs? What are you looking for? And there's not an answer there. Or there just isn't consistent mm. criteria. So 
Um, I, I think that, I guess to, to round that out, I think there's some really exciting opportunities in the type of technology that's coming out, out in order to collect data that then researchers can use and investigate in exciting ways. So would you say then that in your experience, the goals of inclusion research and diversity research for that matter also are, are, are really not, um, there, there is, they cannot be really set in a vacuum, right? It sounds like you really do have to work hand in hand with industry, uh, whether it's tech or any other field, to, to really sh shape those research questions. Um, and that might sound a little self-explanatory, but there are other areas of research that we all well know that kind of just exist in a vacuum on their own, right? Divorced from reality, so to speak. But in, this, in your fields, it sounds like that the goals of research really are also driven by the needs of your uh, subjects, right? Well, for me, um, I relate to some of the things that, um, that the two of you were saying. Um, I mean, this idea of like uh, opening the black box and uh, also like try to really look for alternative explanations that may be explaining some of our findings. At the end of the day, what it means is that um, I love collaborating with companies. I love to go inside of companies, be part of the company for a period of time to understand what are the problems you're trying to solve. Why do you think that some of these studies that have been done are not resonating necessarily with some of the things that we've done research-wise? Because in the process of this kind of collaboration and this kind of conversation, you start realizing uh, there is something that we've done research-wise that is not resonating necessarily with some of these companies. Mm -hmm. So there has to be something else that could be done. And I love the idea that that is true, uh, that I think I've, I've, I've been doing this for a while now, that there's always this reluctance to to open in the doors of the companies because of uh, you know the data and we don't have the data. Maybe what are you going to find? What are you going to find might be bad news. But this kind of idea that by, by opening the doors to the research that we like to do, um, you're also opening the doors to maybe allow us to come up with solutions that can actually solve some of these problems and allow us to really do research uh, that we can publish where it's about providing solutions to other companies in other industries and that can be generalizable or not. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that embedded in that, there has to be this kind of collaboration. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> um, just that you, you mentioned something about this disconnect and I think, uh, you know, I'm not doing academic research but I do have goals for what I would like academic research to do and I think one place where the, this disconnect really happens is you may be able to research, uh, academics may have come up with a, a set of sort of <coughs> interventions that they think are going to work because we've seen them in a lab and maybe tested them also observationally outside. Um, but even if that's a perfect, perfect intervention, there's a next step challenge, which is implementation. How do you get people to do mm -hmm. something that might be new and scary and might be cumbersome, usually around debiasing hiring process? It's just not as fun. You know, you're not, you're not, you we're trying to make it so that, you know, homophily and, and sort of small talk doesn't come in because we tend to want to hire people we like. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I would love to see research that's really asking the questions under what context do new um, sort of organizational innovations about diversity and inclusion succeed and fail? Um, because I think part of where things get lost is, I, I think we still have a lot to learn in terms of where the interventions can work, but from the interventions we know that do work, there's something going on where they're breaking down and they're not being used. Yes. <laughs> Can I add further nuance and also say that we've been talking like for the past few hours about tech in a very general way and there's something very specific about the industry and the culture of the industry that we don't yet fully understand and it's important to understand if we care about addressing these issues. It's also, I think it was Oscar in the earlier panel who was highlighting how it's different from finance or from banking. I also find that to be the case. but. I don't think we theoretically have any precision around it, and I think that's an important part of what we're doing. The other thing that we haven't talked about yet is white men, which, like, going back to why I think about this as differences between groups, um, we've been talking a lot about women and underrepresented minorities, but being a white man is also a, a group that can be, there can be something constraining about that, that I don't fully understand how that's playing out in the workplace, and it's important if you care about bringing people from different groups together. Hmm. For me, can I, can I jump in? Please. Because what you just said is also very related to, um, to, I think, what one of the goals of this research should be, which is trying to really 
design and implement research projects where our findings are somehow robust, right? Mm -hmm. where, where in our analysis, we can actually really provide alternative explanations that people might have, right? So when I go to companies and they come to me and, and, and they start talking about lowering the bar, lowering the bar, I think it's the obsession of the American dream. It's like, are we, are we really lowering the bar, right? <laughs> so you, just, uh, you always have to put yourself in that kind of situation and say, um, under which conditions that will happen mm -hmm. and how can we actually really allow not, not to happen so that we can actually really be very, very uh, explicit when we find some difference that needs to be addressed or some kind of unfairness that we can really account for all the other possibilities that people may have thought about in anticipation for that. And that means that we have to be very careful in the way we design some of these projects, that we have to be very careful in the way we implement it. And that means that there has to be collaboration. Can I sync up these two? Your, can I respond to both of your comments? Which is to Catherine's point about the challenge of implementation and like fully understanding the context and being able to account for alternative explanations. Um, we've spoken a lot about belonging. That's in, that is a thing that I have spent three years trying to understand in a tech company. And just I'll, I'll talk about it more in a minute, but it was very hard to get engineers to answer questions about how they felt or the extent to which they felt like they belonged. And that was devastating for the project. <laughs> so um, right. I think that, like, or so the, we brought up empathy earlier, and I wanted to ask a question about it. Like, these are great concepts in theory, but in practice, so I, you know, month number one, I was very eager as a, as a PhD student, I, I go in to try to run this intervention, and an engineer said, I refuse to fill this out. Like, in what way will it be, will it influence my evaluation? This makes me very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was ill prepared for that because, <laughs> yeah, at that time. Hmm. That's something to think about. To your point about information. And that's why there is a lot of value, and, I, and the type of research I do is very quantitative. Right? But, but I, I understand that there's a lot of value in doing very ethnographic work, yeah. right? Trying to understand the individuals, the actors, the teams, the institutions that you're trying to understand when you're actually also coming out with, with, with solutions. And, and I would like us to really also think in terms of the goals of the research that we do, that is not necessarily only about collecting data and experimenting and random assignment and, and causality but also I like, try to re really generate new arguments, new mechanisms, new processes that then later we can really test in a much so more quantitative way. Can I, can I, may I interject sure. here at this point? Because I'm just di dying to know, what do we know today? What are, what sort of like, what can we say, research has proven this is the state of the art in this area? And it doesn't have to be exhaustive, but just to give us a sense of like, you know, with all the things that we want to do, which we'll finish the conversation about, which, which is also fantastic because you know it's looking into the future and what hasn't been done yet. What what do we know today about um, the state of uh, things um, that we can implement in the field? Sure. So if you're asking the question like, what is the state of the research inclusion? I think that's a challenging question in part because the term comes from outside of academia, right? It is something that is. Right. It doesn't mean it doesn't have value. Academics are not the only people who get to name things, but um, <laughs> I, I think that part of the reason that asking that question may be challenging is for that. But we, if you think about what what people are trying to get at when they use the term inclusion, they're often trying to understand under what context will diversity succeed and fail. Mm -hmm. And we do know a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. We know that mm -hmm. uh, certain norms in work groups work better or worse for, uh, I think of a study that was mixed gender. So adding PC norms was actually found to be effective in, I think it was the outcome was innovation. But I think that the, the, the question unfortunately needs to be translated from you know, the outside world to academia. Um, and you know, Emilio's work on, on meritocracy and what happens in the, that, that's sort of getting at under what sort of cultural context or ideological context, do, does bias come in? Do, do, do we lose um, those benefits of diversity? And I think, so I'm just doing a little bit of translation here, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard question. Yeah. It's a very hard question. Because, because of, of course, research is just always evolving, right? You don't really ever, you know, you produce And the same something. thing with the problems. Uh, and the same and thing the with, with well. the problems we're trying to understand, right? right? Discrimination. Diversity, the meanings of diversity, the meanings of inclusion is just a moving target. 
And also when we start thinking about solutions, I think a lot of the things that the way I read all this literature is uh, that uh, solutions might actually also have unintended consequences, right? So maybe there's a way that we can approach this topic from and, and weave in the last piece, which is what what's there left to do still, right? We know there's a lot left to do. What, like, if you had all the resources available to you and if you had your PhD done already and you could just now say, okay, what else do I want to research? What, what's <laughs> left to be done? <laughs> and maybe that gets, maybe the, answering the question of what's left to do gets to what has been done, what do we know? Um, yes, let me back up and answer. Sure. I, I just, I do think there are some important things that have been, that were said earlier that I want to reiterate, which is that stereotypes are alive and well, and that should be somewhat surprising in 2017. So that I do research in 2015 that replicates what was done 15 years ago is concerning because mm -hmm. it means that those cultural beliefs that are out there haven't changed much. People hinted at um, TV and media. Those are huge sources of where we all get that cultural information. And so I'm not sure why it, I'm not able to, in my research results, find any updating of that. So that's concerning. Um, I also think the other thing we know from research is it's not the behavior of, of a few. So it's not that there are a few people at work who have these beliefs that are awful and that's influencing everyone else or making it like influencing the environment, but that we all have those cultural beliefs on some level and it's worthwhile that we pay attention to that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. No, what I was what I was gonna say is, and I think this is where like what we know, and what what I think we should be doing, or uh, some of some of us should be doing is, we do know, and I'm selective. I mean, asking an academic about what we do know, it's just like it's a, it's torture, right? But because I mean, because I want to have my slides, I want to have twelve sessions, <laughs> right? An hour and a half. But but like, let me just tell you a few things that I think are important. Is that we know that organizations and individuals want to appear as they are good people, mm -hmm. good organizations, right? And in the process of doing that, they're adopting practices at the organizational level that makes them look like they're diverse, mm -hmm. that they're making efforts to solve the problem of lack of diversity. And at the individual level, we do know that nobody really wants to be accused of being sexist or racist or or non-objective or non-meritocratic, right? So, so that, in a way, is just now creating this kind of like a layer of like, like uh, that, that is gonna be very difficult to crack, in my opinion, right? Because you know, even when there is research that is being done identifying how we find situations where there's lack of diversity and fairness, that we're actually, this is again, a moving target, right? That we're actually now generating places where things might be going on. And I think that that's the, actually the role of, of our, our research. I think unpacking, going to places, going to, to new emerging processes and situations where we see some of these old stereotypes and biases to be operating, right? Mm -hmm. And what that means is that, you know, we, got, we have to go to the field and we have to work with, with many of you in, inside of organizations <coughs> because you can help us unpack some of these uh, uh, mechanisms. I just, one more thing that I think we do know that we, uh, but that I think academic, the way that academia is structured, we're not well positioned to answer this, but like I have a project where I track uh, engineers, 500 engineers network, how they work, do their work, who they communicate with over two years, and I don't find differences there, but our field isn't necessarily well positioned to tell you where there are not differences, but mm -hmm. rather where there mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. and so that's another thing to think about when you ask us for the knowledge that these journals produce. Do, do you find that um, industry is more willing to allow itself to be the subject of research now? I mean, in your work with your target companies and individuals and groups and teams and whatnot, um, I mean, your company wouldn't exist if that weren't the case, right? But I'm just gener generally curious, has, even if the, there hasn't been much movement toward, well, there has been incremental change over the decades, but do you find the willingness to engage with the issues to be higher or, or to be more, you know, yeah, um, to open, to be open? Yeah, I mean, just to, just to be clear, so when, when, we, when we at Paradigm work with companies, what we're trying to do is essentially 
diagnose issues. So it's not, not like I think a lot of the strongest research coming out of social science is about intervention. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what we're trying to really un do is understand what's going on. So if you're an organization, you look around, it's relatively homogenous, you might read a, you know, a fast, or Fast Company article, I was going to say Fast Wired, those are two different magazines, <laughs> um, a, a Fast Company article that says that there's promotion problems, so you might assume that there are promotion problems at your company, or you might read something that says that uh, you know you may have a pipeline problem, you don't have people coming into the funnel. So one of the things that we do is, is much more descriptive work. We're, what we're trying to do is tell companies, this is what's going on in your organization, mm -hmm. because we, what we don't want people to do is try to solve the wrong problem. Right. Um, so I, I think... And in that it's a service, right? Because what we are doing is offering them an image of what's going on, which is very different than the work that academics are trying to do, which is zoom out from that individual company. I think, Catherine, you're going to put me out of business. Because <laughs> that, that's precisely the approach that I, I like to follow, right? I mean, precisely, is let's get, let's get inside of the organization. Let's try to really uh, let the data show us Right, what what's going on when you do um, the hiring, when you promote, when you distribute rewards based on performance, and then from there, let's just start think collectively, right? From what we know in research, and also from what we know about your culture and the structures that you have in place, how to come up with a, a, an intervention that you feel comfortable with, right? You know, Emilio, you're always going to be in business because human beings are fallible creatures. <laughs> so we're always going to find something new to, you know, like mess up. <laughs> so don't worry about it. You know, right, there's job right, security right. for right, each yes, one of you. Is, there is job security. There is job security. Um, we're kind of jumping all around, but one thing we haven't spoken about with company data, I, I find it very hard to get inside of organizations and get a complete picture. So people are often willing to show you one part, but not the other, and that makes it hard to understand what's going on. So that access is challenging, but for good reason, because we can't tell you what we're going to find. And we can't, like, you know, I think consulting, you're better able to say, like, these are, this is a set of deliverables we can guarantee. We don't have that ability, so that's stressful. And then one thing we haven't talked about is employee trust. Like mm -hmm. we're talking about going in to something, 12 to 18 hours of people's lives, mm -hmm. five days a week, if not more, and looking at their behavior and saying something about it. And I don't, I don't think that we have a great answer to how to navigate concerns about violating employee trust when there's academic and industry partnerships. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point. I think um, w one of the ways that you know, we try to solve the issue of employee trust, not saying that we've solved it, but it's to really, you know, when you are thinking about top-down, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of uh, policy or practice implementation, also thinking bottom-up. So what can you do to engage employees and under, like, <laughs> communicate and educate and explain what's going on? So if, if it's an intervention that's being tested in the organization, um, communicating about what, um, why one we might be running this intervention and, and what the research is more broadly that's informing what this intervention is, I think that can be really successful in sort of empowering and advocating, in, uh, empowering employees. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, uh, can, I, can I go back? Oh, sorry. Sure. <laughs> can Please. I go back to what I wish I could do if I had endless time and yeah. research budget? Um, one thing that in my own research I've struggled to do is. Um, it's very hard to go in and tell someone that you think this chair is purple, um, but the chair is actually blue. That is very hard to convince someone of. But it is much easier for me to say, oh, you think this chair is purple, but uh, this other group of people, they think it might be blue. And so I, I'm constantly trying to think of ways to shake up cultural content or change the beliefs that people have. And it's hard to erase or shift the ones that are already in their mind, but I might have better success creating new kinds of beliefs and like n new norms, telling them this is now the kind of behavior that's appropriate and here's the group of people who think that. So I'm hopeful that that uh, intervention, that that sort of, that might have results. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, you know, report back if anybody <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, it's all about how you hone your own craft as a researcher yeah. and how you bring your subject along because you're dealing with human beings, so you have to be sensitive to everyone involved. And yes. you've, you've, you've been brought in on invitation, right? So um, yeah, it's a, it, but, but it sounds to me that there is uh, a willingness of, among industry leaders to bring researchers in to help them understand, no? 
themselves better and maybe also be more more uh, more successful. I mean, is there one of the things that we had talked about that we wanted to make sure that we addressed was this um, breaking down of the silos between research, yeah. academia, and industry. So is this, um, you know, do you find, I guess I go back to that question because I haven't maybe heard the answer yet as much. Um, you know, are you finding greater willingness? I will, of course, here I am biasing the answer, right? I want to hear greater willingness among <laughs> industry people today saying, yes, come in and help us, you know, be, so, be better, better people, better uh, employers. I, I, I think, and this is a problem of some of this research that we're doing, is there is self-selection. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So organizations that are trying to do the right thing and they know they're aiming to do the right thing are the ones that are willing to really be part of some of these studies. Um, and there is also self-selection of who can actually authorize some of these studies. I just, if, I, if I ask around this room right now, is how many lawyers do we have here? Lawyers, right? So a lot of, a lot of people from, you know, a lot of CEOs, a lot of executives in, the, in some of these companies are really willing to engage in research with us mm -hmm. when it comes to the legality of some of these things. Uh, we live in a world where actually lawyers will advise companies yeah. not to share a lot of this data that we want to share with. Mm -hmm. and, and when you start like, really getting into non-disclosure agreements mm -hmm. and non-disclosure agreements that will give us the freedom to really be able to publish uh, under the confidentiality because we understand uh, how, how that, that's, that starts disappearing. So we, you know, some of us at MIT, we've come up with a term called uh, kissing frogs, right? <laughs> So basically, uh, uh, the, the process of like going to companies to start projects is like a process of like literally kissing frogs um, until you know one of those you companies a becomes a <laughs> prince or a princess, right? Right, so. right, right, right. And also, just um, it takes time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, it takes a lot of time to really know something well, and people often want a project that is a one-year project, and that has not been the case. Right. Often for me, these are multi-year like trial relationships. So that's a big investment. Right. Yeah, it is. But it's well worth it, right? Um, and you're all doing really important work because at the end of the day, it's about it's about human human happiness and value that we're talking about, as well as the bottom line. But you know, unfortunately, in our culture, we conflate the two. I. Can I just say one more thing? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, one I'm more done. thing. I'm <laughs> A lot of people who actually do this work, who are like diversity officers or, or work in companies, are doing really great things that I think it would be great if you, it, we should be, that should be contributing to the like academic literature, to the knowledge as well. So if you're running programs that are effective, we should be writing that up so that everyone can benefit and learn about it as well. Absolutely. And that's the other piece that gets lost mm -hmm. um, as a possible positive upside. Yep. Yeah, uh, we can we can co-author with you too. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, so I, I was just gonna briefly. We we are also seeing a lot of social scientists move into industries like tech. Yeah, so that might yeah. be a great brokerage right. yeah. Um, yeah. for some of these things. Excellent. Which is right. Optimistic. So there so there are opportunities for for PhDs beyond academia. Yes, yeah. that's good to know. Yes. That's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, scholar practitioner is really is really sort of like I think that's a really exciting new field of. Um, professional engagement. So I wanted to actually open up to the audience if anybody has any burning questions for this crack team of researchers. Um, yes. Hi, thank you for coming here. Um, so um, I wanted to ask, when you go into an organization um, and you start to look at the data, I'm guessing that it's if you see that um, a number of people left the company Maybe a lot of them are female. Maybe a lot of them left for reasons like, I'm going to go to grad school, or I decided to be a stay-at-home mom, or you wouldn't necessarily think to say, well, did they leave because it was a hostile work environment? Did they leave because they weren't being promoted? So my question is, how do you get at what a company might not provide in terms of data? Right? The, the, it shows that that a team, you know, people left a team or they, they have trouble with retention. Mm -hmm. How do you get it, like the subtext of why those people left really without talking, I mean, can you talk to the ex-employee? Is there a way mm -hmm. that you get, a, get around 
um, kind of what the what the what might be an, a reason that isn't uncoverable. Right. So it's a great question. I think sometimes we get that information and sometimes we don't. I think there's the challenge for us when we're doing that work is to understand how to interpret it. So you know, we, we may, when, if we were to see like a high attrition rate for women, that would be a cause for concern, even if we don't know what those reasons are. And then what we'd have to do is substitute that information with what we do when we do our interviews and focus groups. So those things would come up in those contexts, even if they're not in the quantitative data. But it's also about not over-interpreting, you know, mm -hmm. and, and saying, well, we, we, we see a high attrition rate, we don't know why that's something to investigate, and then we investigate it in those qualitative ways. We also look at our inclusion survey, and some of the, some of the questions that you're, some of the causes that you are pointing to might come out there as well. So it's really about uh, a 360 view and really getting at it, and not relying on a single number or a single, uh, a single, single metric, but trying to paint a full picture. Um, can I also add that by the time you get access to that data, like it's not adversarial. So there's no, I, in my experience, I haven't found that they are unwilling to tell you why if like, if something bad happened or if that person left and had a horrible experience. They're willing, people are willing to share that um, because you've gone through a lot of legal hoops to get to that point. And uh, the best I, I've never contacted someone who had left that was outside of the parameters of what I could do. But I have interviewed and. Um, tried to ask around like other coworkers and colleagues in the same group to get a good sense. But that's a good plug for mixed methods research. <laughs> yeah. So I'd like to know what does the research tell us about how homogeneous company climates, the use of the word fit, and conversations about diversity and inclusion intersect? The reason why I'm asking that <clears throat> is because I believe that there are anecdotal conversations that occur <clears throat> in companies, among employees, middle management. But I'm asking, what is the research? Does the research even tell us anything about how they intersect? And if so, what does it tell us? So I know um, I, I, um, I, t I teach one class. So I teach two classes that I feel very fortunate to be teaching that I kind of developed after my sabbatical um, in 2013, when I came to the Valley of Meritocracy <laughs> to, do, to continue studying, that um, uh, one, one of the classes that I teach is from the supply side, right? Basically, is, um, the title of the class is called Building Successful Careers and Organizations. And what that means is I'm, I'm helping my students to really understand what we know uh, from studies about what can happen when you start applying for jobs and when you get inside of organizations and you start being interviewed and you start being, right? So, so there's a lot of research that I would love to share with you if, if, you, if, if you want, but there's one in particular that came out when you were talking and asking your question is Lauren Rivera at Northwestern. Um, she actually really spoke uh, about the concept of fit and how fit, because it's culturally defined, right? So when you're in situations where you say, you're not a good fit for my organization. Again, if you haven't really spent the time to really define what are the criteria that needs to be, to be put in place in order to define fit, that that's when people really introduce a lot of their biases in what they think, right? So like the whole thing about the consultant, the consultant test of, you know, at the end of the day, fit is with whoever you would like to get stuck in the airport, right? It's just, it just has to do with a lot with homophily, with liking, nothing about like criteria that you, you will actually really value. So I would actually recommend that you go and read Lauren Rivera because uh, her work will actually answer some of these questions. And, and I think that at the end of, uh, of, of, of her paper, she does a good job also in, in, in pointing you to, to different studies. But I'll be at the reception, so we can also <laughs> talk. And, and, uh, yes. and, and just to add, I was also thinking about that paper. Um, you know, she, she defines culture through leisure activities. So things like, do you play tennis or I don't know right. what the, or like what kind of music hobbies. you, yeah, hobbies, stuff like that. But, um, and, and most of it's like a sort of darker story, but then the upside is that the, the, the those sort of leisure activities can um, connect, um, you know, underrepresented groups to the company. It doesn't happen as often, but she sort of poses that as a, a potential upside to this dynamic. Um, so I, I don't think, I think overall it, it is a darker story, but I think that's just to add a little nuance to the paper. Anyone else? Uh. I'm loud. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hi. Oh my God, I'm so excited you're here. I'm like aggressively fangirling. I love your research. Um, I win more arguments with it than almost anything. Um, but no, I have a question is, uh, I was gonna start with the premise of what do you lose sleep at night over? Because I do lose sleep at night over. What one construct or concept do you lose sleep over because we don't have a satisfactory definition or measurement strategy mm -hmm. about? Sorry, it's didn't mean to make that hard. Oh, I have one. Um, so I've been thinking a lot, uh, there's a lot of uh, measures in, in the literature about how to sort of condense an, an organization into a single number that is diversity. And I've been thinking about that a lot. But one of the challenges is that it, the measure works for one frame of diversity and not another. So if you're coming from diversity as heterogeneity, where um, you know a white man is equivalent to, you know, if you read to seven, seven thirty, um, seventy thirty men and women, it would be the same as the reverse. Versus the social justice frame, which thinks about those things very different, differently, and thinks about the sort of cultural <laughs> context and the fact that men have been in power for so long, and they wouldn't consider, um, you know, reversing those proportions as equivalent. Um, so that's something that I have been thinking about a lot uh, because I think it's, yeah, it's very nerdy. But um, I, I want, if, if we're trying to simplify information, <laughs> I would love it um, to really represent sort of like the, the, the beliefs and assumptions about diversity. And I think when I get challenged to think about what frame am I talking about, am I talking about diversity as heterogeneity where people are types and it doesn't matter what type they are, or am I thinking about it from the social justice frame where type matters a lot? Hmm. So I have a different answer. Do you want to? I'm thinking. Okay. Um, I, th I networks, social networks. So I think we overblow. I think we know that they matter. We're not particularly <laughs> precise about why. We know that there are disadvantages uh, for different people from different kinds of groups, and we don't. <coughs> we're not very precise about how that's happening. I think we overblow some of the differences. So there's research out there that suggests that men and women you know, go through work and do their jobs differently because of their gender. I'm like in how we go about completing our tasks. That's like a kind of network difference that keeps me up at night. So I think that whole field, that whole sub body of work mm -hmm. could use some clarifying. It's a potential opportunity for a future for another PhD. <laughs> That's right. somebody else. Is that in your conclusion chapter? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I haven't written it yet, so. Oh. <laughs> it will be. <laughs> so for me, and I think I've, 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 uh, I've had more time to think about it, which is unfair, right? I've, I've thought a little bit more about this. Um, for me, one of the things that I've been thinking about is when I work with companies, there, is in, uh, there are two ways of always thinking about solutions. That is a very, a very economic economist approach. There is the supply and the demand, right? So sometimes it's the demand, it's the employer, it's the, the organizations hiring who are the bad actors. They're not doing the right thing. They're not putting the practices in place, there, right? And then there's a lot of research, it's, it's the supply, it's women and minorities. They're self-selecting, their they're interest, they're not, in, right? And, and, and for me, what I'm actually really losing sleep is that there is very, re, very little research about the intersection mm. where demand and supply myths happens to be in the workplace, happens to be when we're being evaluated, when we're being hired through the interview processes. And at that point is where like, you start like, really th seeing that that's where new forms of unfairness are emerging, right? So in one of the research projects, for example, is, is I'm looking at that place of where demand and supply may meet, and it has to do with uh, recruiting fairs and has to do online, the way recruiters are posting jobs and the type of language that they use and how they choose to respond to certain people or not, right? At that point, is where, as you can see, it's like a place where like demand meets supply. Mm -hmm. And now with all the technology, it's just really, really even more obvious to me that that's the place where we should be looking at. Can I ask you a follow-up question? Um, are, so we've been talking a lot about moments of hiring and evaluation. Are there other like moments in the work, in the cycle of work? Yeah, when recruiters are actually really going, I mean, when organizations are paying, are paying recruiters to go and recruit the best. But it's part of hiring. I think of that as part of hiring. Okay, all right. right. But 
Anything in the middle? I'm just curious. Thinking of Linda Babcock's study yeah. on um, non-promotional tasks and about asking whether women um, versus men like <coughs> offer themselves up to do work. We, we, this was this came up um, in the last panel uh, for uh, Latino folks, but um, whether they're offering to do different work or whether they're being asked and trying to tease that apart. Um, I don't actually remember the results, but it was a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, another thing that I've been thinking about that I also lose sleep over is, and, and you relate too because of your work on social networks, right? So I started working on social networks when social networking was not even, not even a verb, right? The networking, how to learn how to network, right? So if you really start really thinking about like how organizations are now formalizing a lot of these networking approaches to hire and select individuals, mm -hmm. you, we start finding that everybody now is being trained that you absolutely need to network in order to get a job. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, we know that there are other processes through which now technology uh, operate, right? So now as the group, as the head of the work and organization studies group, just to, just to yeah. you know, there is a lot of recommendation, which is like a form of networking. But then I realized that I started getting quick emails from individuals to say, oh, you may want to look at this application, mm -hmm. right? There, those are processes that are invisible mm -hmm. that some individuals may not necessarily know that that's a way of activating ties that can actually uh, 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 influence them, right? So that's the type of things that, that I think are, are, can, can get lost if we look at this process from a very kind of traditional way, yeah. given now all the changes that have been happening in the way we do some of these things, right? And just to, th I think this is a plug for organizations and particularly people in HR and recruiting to document these things because you can yeah. do it, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you take a really rigorous approach to how you're going to document what your hiring process looks like, you can mark, and these are these complicated systems to do this, you can mark when you're getting an email. And I think that's, I would, just a strong plug for people who are doing this work that this data will be helpful for you. Um, and that you really have to do the work to, to start to document these things because otherwise they do remain invisible. Hmm. Does anyone else have a question? I, yeah, I, 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 yeah. Oh, I actually yes. grabbed the microphone. <laughs> oh. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, I, so actually, I do think that the other critical moments are promotions. I mean, how people's careers go are a big determinant of whether they feel like they're part of an organization, whether they stay or leave. Okay. So it's not just the hiring moment. I think it's harder to measure. But I actually had a, a much different question at a different level, which is everybody in this room seems to believe that meritocracy is just kind of vaporware, that it's really, you know, we use that word, but it's really, it's just to hide our biases or whatever. Um, I think most people in this building, this is a building of, you know, engineers, believe deeply in meritocracy. Mm. So how do we combat, I mean, how do we talk to people who, at their core, believe that this is, not only is it something that exists and is real, but it's also something that's very positive. That this is, you know, this is progress. That we have a merit meritocratic system in, you know, in the valley or in our economy. It's a huge question, I just want to know. For me, for me, for me I, I encounter that kind of... It's um, pervasive that kind of uh, feeling every time I go and I teach undergrads at MIT, for example, right? Um, this idea that this, has, this is never going to happen to me, that's just I, I'm an outlier because, you know, I've worked very hard, I work, um, you know, I, I'm at MIT or I got access to like a high, um, um, higher education. So for me, and, and I'm biased in my approach, um, it's, it's just basically showing them uh, good research that shows that, again, it's been well implemented, that shows that under certain conditions, you know, there, there's something that is going on, right? And I think that that's why, like, when I do these building, building successful careers, a lot of the things that I do, and that's why, like, students appreciate that at the end, is that slowly you show them research when they start, like, really, you're, you help them anticipate things that are just going to happen once they join the labor force, mm -hmm. that they're going to start like, really looking back and say, well, there were some warnings in some of these studies, and now I can relate to why I hear the news, and I see that this might be also operating in companies, right? But, um, but that's also like what the, 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 the true belief of meritocracy is, that once you're embedded in that kind of culture, it's very hard for you to believe that that's not the case. Right? I, I also think that um, 
Aubrey raised this point earlier that different people from different backgrounds are invested in the idea of meritocracy to a, in different ways, and we need to understand that if right. that's a concept you're trying to change. And I want to circle back to what I said about white men, which is that that's actually a big part of how masculinity gets constructed and reinforced, and that that's why I think we need to understand that process, N not just yeah, from a research perspective. And you know, in, in terms of like, I think there's this idea that. Uh, coding is objective and what, what you know gets spit out either from like a machine learning algorithm is objective but yeah. like mm. I mean I have very strong biases about code I like to read and code I don't like to read I know that it's silly but I just have strange preferences but we also know that there are machine learning algorithms that are coming out and racist classifiers there's that, um, that mm. there's a lot of things going on like that where, where like I think people I think you really need to push people, okay, so you believe that this is objective, why do you think this is objective? I, I don't really know where it comes from, um, but I, th I think there's plenty of examples in the work that they do, which I think inspires their belief that everything makes sense and the world is just and stuff like that, um, but really pushing them on the, on the actual work that they do, because they're making a lot of dis subjective decisions all the time. I have one, m one more quick thought about this, too, is if, if we actually tell um, millennials and the future generations, that meritocracy doesn't work. What works? Are mm -hmm. we telling them that then we should actually really even abandon this ideal that, that we're going to distribute based on merit and talent? What do you give them instead? So this is just one of those things that is very, very hard to really like, what's the alternative? What's the alternative, right? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a huge issue. So these are all fantastic questions and avenues for future research implicit bias also being part of this. And I guess my own you know, two cents on meritocracy is um, I, I know a lot of us non-engineers also believed at one point that that was how we would become successful. And in a way, it, it was actually, it, 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 it cushioned us from appreh apprehension as we went into the workforce but only to find later on that the biases are all still out there. So maybe, maybe it's true meritocracy that we have to uh, 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 aim for and create a, a true transparent um, and inclusive um, op field of opportunity for everyone. So meritocracy may not be dead as such. It may just be that we need to expand it to, um, and raise consciousness as well. That's what I hear going on here sub subliminally is that your work is, is all about raising consciousness and questioning people on their current beliefs. So um, Sanas, Emilio, Catherine, thank you so much. I know we're at the end of our hour. This is delightful. Thank you so much.